Well, for a few minutes tonight, I would like to look at chapter 32 with you of Genesis. Genesis chapter 32. The whole chapter will be our text. I'm sure this incident is quite well known to most of us here, but it's good to refresh our minds and memories concerning a very notable experience to one of the Old Testament patriarchs. And the title I want to give to our meditation tonight is The Crowned Cripple. The Crowned Cripple. Here he was, Jacob. He was on his way back to the promised land. And he had a mysterious encounter. And no matter what you've heard about this encounter, it is a mysterious encounter. There are many questions that are not answered. But we know basically what happened. But nevertheless, even with the knowledge that we do have, it is a mysterious matter. Uh, But this mysterious matter changed his life, physically and spiritually. We're not going to say for one moment it was a, a conversion experience like the time when he first began to believe. No, nothing like that at all. But it was a conversion experience in the sense that his spiritual life was in some sense transformed. It was invigorated because of what happened to him at the end of this chapter. Well, we want to go through this chapter and we want, under the help of the Lord, to draw one or two uh, practical applications for ourselves this evening. Well, what do we have here? Jacob, verse 1, went on his way. We didn't read it, of course, but chapter 31 deals with uh, his departure from his father-in-laws, Laban. Now, Laban was very like Jacob himself. Both of them were schemers. Both of them were thinkers. Both of them were deceivers in some sense. And Jacob had a terrible time with Laban. He had been with him for 20 years. And for 14 years he served in order to have Laban's two daughters, Rachel, which was Jacob's first choice, and then Leah, which was given to him by deception. And then he, he served another six years for his wages. And as you know that during that six years, Jacob's flock grew substantially. He may well have employed a trick of the trade, I'm not going to go into the details, but it may have been a superstitious thing. We can't be certain. It may well have been a trick of the trade with some kind of superstition, but ultimately it was God that blessed him. And it was God who gave him his enlarged flock, so that when he left Laban, he left as a very, very rich individual. And here he was on his way. Uh, Where was he going to? Well, the text will tell us he was making his way back to the promised land. He had been out to the promised land for 20 years after he had got the birthright by deception. He had to leave his homeland because Esau wanted to kill him. And his wife, his mother, Rebecca, told him, basically, get out of here. Go and get a wife from my kindred and Esau. He'll get over it, he'll calm down, and you'll be able to come back. Well, the scriptures would teach us that for the 20 years that he was away, his mother died. He never saw his mother again. But he was eager to get back to the promised land. And this is important for us to realize, he was being obedient. It wasn't just that he wanted to go, the Lord told him to go. It was time now for him to go back to the promised land. He was the covenant head, or he would be certainly when Isaac would pass on. The blessing was now upon Jacob, and he was the covenant head. And the church, the the Old Testament church at this time, was not in the promised land. And God said, basically, it's time to get back to the promised land. And Jacob, therefore, was being obedient. 
He simply did not want to leave because he was fed up with uh, Laban. He wanted to go back because the Lord had told him to return to the promised land. So he was on an obedient outing, we might say. And the angels of God met him. We can stop there for one or two moments, friends, because what was happening here? Well, surely this was God who was encouraging him. He had a terrible time with Laban. And as we will see, he had to wrestle with Laban. For 20 years, he basically wrestled with Laban. Now he was free from Laban, and he put all that behind him. He was going on now to the promised land, and he would trying to hopefully encounter his brother Esau to try to make amends and try to be reconciled to his brother. And the Lord recognized this was on his heart. This was something that was disturbing him, and rightly so, because Esau, when he left 20 years ago, wanted to kill him. And how did Jacob know that things had changed, or maybe they had not changed? Therefore, and the angels of God met them. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. This is what happened to him when he left his homeland. The angels of God met him there, and they were encouraging him. He had left with nothing but his staff, and he was going to lay down that night, and he was going to go to sleep. And if you, you know the story in chapter 28, the angels of God were there, and he saw a ladder that went up to heaven. And there were the angels of God. They were comforting him. He was beginning a journey. He was leaving his mother and father behind. He was leaving everything that was familiar behind. He was out of his comfort zone. He was, he was an individual who tended to stay around the home. He wasn't like Esau, who was out hunting all the time. He dwelt in tents, the Bible tells us. And therefore, this was a big step for him when he left. Well, God knew that, and God gave him the angels to encourage him. And here now he's coming back into the promised land, and he's got problems, he's got difficulties, he's got concerns, and God sends the angels again to encourage him. Does this not remind us, friends, then, and does, it, does this not encourage us? The Lord is way ahead of every believer. The Lord knows your difficulties. He knows what's in front of you. He knows your cares. He knows your concerns. Everything is known unto him. And God is the one who would encourage us to go forward. To go forward. He's with us. The Lord has said, as we keep saying, and it's good for us to be reminded, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And this was true on this occasion. Jacob, with all his sheep, with all his cattle, with all he had, with his eleven sons and one daughter, and two wives and two concubines, he needed to be encouraged. And God does encourage us. And God does encourage us on the narrow road that goes to life. We need that encouragement. God goes before us. He may well not send angels like he did in this occasion, but angels are ministering spirits. They are still operative in the 21st century. We can't see them, but he still sends them. And he would encourage us, friends. He longs to see his father, but he dreads to see his brother. What does he do? He sends a very kind and humble messenger or message. Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, and to the land of Seir, the country of Edom. Now, I can't be certain about this, but according to one commentator, Jacob did not need to actually pass by Edom to go to the promised land. And it would seem that Jacob... He was going to be quite close to where Esau was. And therefore he felt it would be good to be introduced and to be reconciled to his brother. Although he didn't need to do it, he could have bypassed Edom. But this was Jacob. He wanted this matter dealt with. 
and he sent a very kind and humble message to his brother. There's a lesson for us, for all of us. There's a lesson for the world. What is it? Our past will catch us out. You know, <clears throat> in modern society today, what are people trying to do? They're trying to rewrite history. They're trying to erase history. You can't do that. And sometimes you will be confronted with your history. Well, Jacob was going to be confronted. He wanted the matter to be dealt with. And if there are skeletons in our cupboards, friends, they will come out and they have to be dealt with. Your past, whatever it is, if it's not dealt with, it will come to the fore. Why did he do this? Why did he send this message to uh, Esau? Well, he certainly wa wanted to be reconciled to him, but he wanted Esau to know that he had been away for 20 years and he wasn't a fugitive. He wasn't a vagabond. He was with a relative. And therefore, when he was coming back, he was coming back as a prosperous and self-sufficient individual. He was not going to be a drain on Esau or upon his father Isaac. And in that sense, he was not going to be a drain on whatever Esau might get from Isaac's will. Jacob was well able to support himself, and he would not be a drain or a burden upon anyone. And he wanted Esau to know this. And he wanted Esau to know that he was not looking for any trouble. He was coming on friendly terms. He wanted to be reconciled to his brother. Now the response. Well, we know what the response is. Esau was going to come with 400 men to meet him. And as a result, Jacob, we're told in verse 7, was greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided his people up and he took the decision, well, if Esau is going to attack one party, well, the other party will escape and it will not be curtains for me. That was his pragmatic approach initially because he was fearful. He had a plan. But friends, he also had a prayer. He also had a prayer. And we find this here in verse 9. He calls upon the God of my father Abraham and the God of my father Isaac. He calls upon the, his father's historical God. The one true and the living God. The one who had delivered his fathers. The one who had revealed himself to his fathers. The one who had been good to his fathers. And therefore he was calling upon the one true and the living God. And he remembered what his God had done for his fathers. And basically he was asking that the same God would deliver him also. The great God of heaven. And he reminds God that God is the one who told him to return to the promised land. Return unto thy country and to thy kindred and I will deal well with thee. What's he saying here? Well, basically he's saying, I am being obedient to what thou hast said. I am merely doing what you have told me to do, and therefore fulfill thy promise. He was pleading the promises. And this is a good way to come before God, recognizing that he is a great historical God, a God who has done wonderful things in the past, and a God who has kept his promises to his people. And indeed his promises, his word cannot fall to the ground. And therefore this is to encourage us to pray to pray the promises that God has given to remind him of his promises. He also prays with humility. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies. 
he acknowledges that 20 years ago he went out with nothing but a staff, nothing but that. And now he's coming back as an extremely rich individual. And he acknowledges that all of this has been given to him from God. This is the way, friends, that we are to pray. We are to recognize that we deal with the great God of heaven, a God who is omnipotent, a God who has delivered his people in the past, and a God who will not fail, whose promises cannot fail, and a God who is always will look after those who are obedient. And we have to acknowledge the mercy of God, how he has been good to us in times past. And will he now abandon his people? Will he now abandon uh, Jacob? Having taken him back after blessing him, will he now abandon him? No. This was his prayer. Well, he had a plan, but he had a prayer. He was in trouble. He admits he was fearful. Does he not say that? Later on, deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him. Here is someone who is exceedingly honest and open and frank before God. He is revealing his heart. Have you got a problem? Have you got difficulties? Have you got Esau's in front of you that you've got to face in a day or two, a week or two, a month or two, a year or two? Have you got something that's really fearful on your mind, Christian? God knows it. Why don't you admit it? Why don't you come before him? Express your fear to God. God alone can take away that fear. I'm reminded about a, an incident in Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. His, I can't remember the title of it, but it's the first 40 years, I think it's called. And it's, it talks about his wife, Bethan. I believe her name is Bethan, his wife. She was a Christian, a believer. But she did not like the storms. And where she was living in Wales at one time, very often she was beside the seaside where she was living. And it could be extremely windy. And the waves would be roaring and tossing. And she did not mind admitting that she was fearful about these things. It was all right when Mr. Jones was, Mr. Lloyd Jones was there. But when he wasn't there, she was petrified. On one occasion, he was away preaching. And the storm came and the wind came. She had a young baby. She was fearful. What am I going to do? What if the water comes up here? What did she do? She turned to the Lord in prayer. Instantly, the fear was gone. God knew her heart. But she went and expressed her petition, her fear before the living God. And it was taken away. Friends, don't be afraid to be open with God. Oh, we must be reverent, of course. We must be humble, of course. But tell what's on your heart. Have you got a difficulty coming up? The Christian should not fear death. But is it not true that we do? Tell the Lord. The Christian should not fear a terminal illness. But we do. Tell the Lord. This is what happened here. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother. God who had shown, who had given the angels to him. God who had fed him and provided for him for two decades. He was a believer, but he was a fearful believer. And he admits it. And God accepted his prayer. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. We sang it earlier on in Psalm 56 
Verse 3, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. That's a good prayer. That's a good position. But friends, it's not a perfect position. Because every moment of every day, we should be trusting the Lord. What time I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. Well, he uttered this prayer, and it was a notable prayer from the heart. But do you notice afterwards, he seeks to appease Esau, verses 13 to 23. He gives a present to Esau. I'm not going to elaborate upon it. You know it. We read it. But basically, he, he, um, he provides, one counted it, 580 animals as a present to Esau. And they would arrive in stages, in various droves. And the hope was that when he saw one of the droves, and then when he saw the next drove, and the th third drove, and the fourth drove, and how many droves there were, this would have the effect of appeasing Esau. Now, one commentator I consulted uh, gives uh, Jacob a hard time for this. And basically he says he should not have done, done this. But other commentators like Matthew Henry and Calvin, they are of a, a more charitable position altogether. And they say this is what he should have done. He prayed, that's true, but God uses means as well. And therefore this, this was before him. He had these animals. He wanted to be reconciled. He did what he could. And he left the outcome to God. And therefore they are much more charitable to him. And if we read one or two verses uh, in the Proverbs, for instance, it will tell you there about giving of gifts. A gift is as a precious stone in the eyes of him that hath it. Whithersoever it turneth, it prospereth. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 8. And Proverbs chapter 21 Verse 14, a gift in secret pacifieth anger, and a reward in the bosom strong, and a reward in the bosom strong wrath. Maybe you think he should not have done it. Well, I'm certainly of the opinion that he did no wrong. He prayed, and therefore he did what he humanly could in order to be reconciled to Esau, his brother. But Jacob was a schemer, and he was still a schemer here. And there may well have been other reasons why he sent that number of animals and the droves. Consider this. The livestock would slow Esau down. It would, in some sense, be a burden to Esau and his 400 men. Here they would have to look after all these animals also. The livestock would be noisy. Esau could not come up to Jacob unawares. He couldn't ambush him with this 580 animals there as well. Plus... When the droves came, did they not come with Jacob's servants also? And therefore, Jacob's servants would be amongst Esau's household. And if there was going to be any kind of conflict, Jacob's servants were right there in the midst. So it may well be that when he did this, yes, he would want to appease Esau, but there was also some scheming behind it. That's the kind of individual Jacob was. But now we come to the, the main part, if you like, of uh, the chapter. And the angel and Jacob wrestle. We find this referred to in the book of Hosea. In Hosea chapter 12, in the Old Testament, in the, one of the prophets, Hosea chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, there the, the prophet relates this story. 
And he says this of Jacob. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. Amongst other things, that's what is said for us concerning this incident or concerning Jacob. What happened here? Well, it's a mysterious thing. Jacob by this time had uh, put his two wives, his two concubines, and all his uh, flesh and blood, they had gone over the book Jabbok. And Jacob was left alone. He wanted more time to pray and to meditate before the great day was before him. So he got rid of all kinds of distractions. Everything was set for the morning. And here was Jacob alone. And we're told in verse 24, Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. This man was an angel. We're inclined to believe that it was the angel of the covenant. We are of the opinion that this was the pre-incarnate Son of God appearing as a, a man wrestling with Jacob. And they wrestled together for some time. And the angel could not overcome him. Now, of course, an angel is a very strong individual. And it would seem that he did not really want to overcome him. He was going to test how long that Jacob would continue. And someone give a good illustration about this, what was happening here. There are men here who are fathers. They will play with their children. Maybe they will do some wrestling with their children, their young sons, for instance. And they will wrestle to a certain extent with them, but they will never use their full strength upon their sons. If they have a son, for instance, who is six years old and they're a bit rough with that son, they will be a bit rougher with a ten-year-old. But on both occasions, they'll never use their strength to the full. Well, this is what was happening here. The angel was an extremely powerful and could easily have overpowered Jacob. But Jacob continued and they wrestled. And he wrestled with him, we're told. And he said, let me go, for the day breaketh. Now, this was the angel who said, let me go, for the day breaketh. Why did he say that? Well, he said that, friends, because at the moment it was dark. And Jacob could not see the face of the angel. But when it became daylight, he would see the face of the angel. And no one can see God and live. That's why the angel wanted to end this before the light came. Because if the light came and they were still wrestling and Jacob was able to see the angel, he would see the face of God. And the likelihood is he would die. Now this, from, this would teach us that Jacob was absolutely determined to wrestle with them until he got the blessing. No matter if when the light would come, he would see the face of God. This is what we're meant to believe and understand here. Jacob was out and out and determined to get this blessing. We might say, at any cost. <laughs> he goes on in the encounter. In verse 27, the angel says, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. 
I'm very grateful to one commentator who said that as far as the Genesis record is concerned, the last time that someone asked Jacob, what was your name? Or what is your name? It was his father. It was his father on that occasion when Jacob deceived him and said that he was Esau. <clears throat> we find the question in chapter 27 of Genesis, Who art thou, my son? And he says, Esau. Here, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And what did the, the angel then say? Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. There was going to be a change. Jacob means supplanter. Israel, a prince with God. Now we don't think for one moment that there was a tremendous change that came over Jacob because of the name change. We're not saying that for one moment. Jacob, there was, he was still a work in progress, but basically God, what God was saying here to him, the old life is gone. It's the new life, a new way, a new direction. You are a prince with God. You're not to be known now as, as a supplanter. A new way, a new name, a prince with God. It is said then <coughs> that he won. That's what it says. In, uh, he had power with God. He had power over the angel and prevailed. That's what Hosea says about this encounter. He wept and made supplication unto him. What was happening here? Jacob was broken. And it was only when he was broken that he, that he won. He came to an end of himself. And therefore, having been broken, he actually won. And this is what God does. This is what God does with his people. He breaks them in order that they might see their great need of him. What was going to happen here? What was happening the next day? Jacob was going to encounter Esau. Jacob had already wrestled with Laban and overcame him. Jacob wrestled here with God. He wept, he was broken, but he won. He wrestled with God. And now, in the morning, he was going to face what he thought was his greatest enemy. He was going to meet Esau. He was going to wrestle with him. And what God was saying is, you have wrestled with God. Surely now you can go out and you can wrestle with your brother. You don't need to fear. That's what was happening here. Paul speaks about my grace is sufficient for thee. That's what God said to Paul. Paul wanted his handicap taken away. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. This is what Jacob was realizing. Weeping, supplications, broken, yet he won. And therefore, he can go out and face tomorrow, knowing that whatever he will encounter, he will win. Well, it's the same for the Christian, friends. We might not have the same kind of experience that Jacob had. But nevertheless, we serve the same God. And we will have things that will tax us, occasions that will overwhelm us, 
that we will acknowledge that they are too great for us, but not for God. And when we are broken, and when we come to an end of ourselves, and when we cast ourselves upon God and Him alone, then we are conquerors. Here he was then, the crowned cripple. He left the scene hobbling, but he was a prince with God. Amen. And may God be pleased to bless his word to us. Let us